Today's video is sponsored by Blue Jays. I mean, Conqueror's Blade, a free-to-play tactical action MMO which combines medieval and renaissance history with fantasy. It's got over 55 units like Cataphract Lancers and Winged Hussars, for example. You have online siege battles and you can create or join a hort horse, a house, to fight with other players and share resources. Season 2 brought three new battlefields, a new battle pass, and a new unit, the Sons of the Steps, obviously inspired by the Mongols. The game gets regular updates and added content, and there's a new player bonus if you sign up, which is a gold helmet, three 10 battle unit XP cards, three 10 battle hero XP cards, and three Huacha arrow launchers. So give it a try, the link is in the video description down below. I'm sure most of you know how to end him rightly by throwing the pommel, even though that's technically a mistranslation, but let's ignore that. It's way funnier to think of it as end him rightly rather than quickly. I do think delivering a murder stroke with a pommel also counts as ending somebody rightly. So sometimes people ask, uh, why not put spikes on the pommel? Would that make it more effective for these techniques? And Fair enough. So let's take a look at it. Is, is there any evidence of that being done in history? Now, if you look at the historical manuals, uh, most of them are something like this. And you see some other shapes as well, but spiked usually not, with a couple of exceptions. In Hans Talhofer's fighting treatise from 1459, you do see very obviously spiked pommels, and they, they clobber each other with those. Uh, also, the guard may be pointed or spiked as well. You also have these interesting designs in an Italian manuscript by Filippo di Vadi Pisano from the 1480s. They don't look quite as fantasy as some of the other things you'll see, but it's noticeable that the pommel is pointed or basically teardrop shaped, and you also have straight pointed quillons. Also, the blade widens toward the end. Then you've got the Cluny Fechtbuch from the 1480s to 1500s, where in this case, kind of similar to this, except more pronounced. You have sort of hooks that the quillons terminate in, and you also have a spiked pommel, as well as what looks like a discard toward the upper third of the blade. And that's also something you see in one of these sketches from Talhofer. You also have that rondelle-looking discard in the center of the blade. And this is also a particularly strange design. You have one spike that points upward and one that points downward on the guard, and the pommel also has asymmetrical one-sided spike and then the center spike, and uh, the other two, and then you also have another one with pointed pommel and guard. And Paulus Hector Meyer in his treatise from the 1540s has a very similar design to the Cluny Fecht book. It's basically the same thing. You also have the hooks on the quillons and you have the, the guard in the center, and the spike pommel. Meyer also compiled an earlier treatise from the 1470s, and that looks actually like a fairly standard longsword aside from three spikes on the pommel. So what's up with all of these? Uh, so far, I was under, under the impression that there's nothing has been found uh, as in physical finds from the time that look anything like this. But then I kept digging and actually found something interesting. There's a 2015 article written by Mace Talaga, uh, published in the Acta Periodica Duellatorum, which examines the so-called Teutonic S-talk from a museum in Krakow, Poland. This is roughly dated to the 14th or 15th century, and it has a thick, unsharpened blade with a rectangular, almost square cross-section. It has thick quillons with almost square cross-section and rounded points. And also, it's got a really large solid pommel with four concave sides. And the pommel alone weighs over a kilogram, which is almost two and a half pounds. Uh, the, the total weight of the sword is four kilograms or 8.8 .8 pounds. To put that in pr into perspective, that's similar to a large Zweihander. And that's an overall length of 1.58 meters, or a bit over 5 feet. So this is a very, very strange sword. I've never seen anything like it. And it's not quite as pronounced as the spike pommels 
from the manuscripts, but you can see it kind of goes in that direction. So with a bit of artistic freedom, if you were to draw a pommel like this, you would kind of end up with something like that. Maybe this was a prototype and maybe then later they came up with a pommel that had actual spikes welded to it. So if you look at the drawing of this at first glance, it looks like a fairly regular S-talk, even though the, the pommel is unusual. But the way it's designed, it's almost more of a pole arm. You know, if you think about it, this much weight, it, it's basically it's just a pointy metal bar at that point. So this is designed to, to really thrust into the gaps of the armor with the point and also strike with the guard and pommel. With such a heavy pommel, you can imagine how effective that would be. So this is a dedicated anti-armor weapon. The article also mentions another S-talk. This is from the Lithuanian National Museum in Vilnius. And this has a, an actual spiked pommel. You can see individual distinct spikes on it. And it's approximately dated to between the 14th and 16th century, which is very, very vague, like spanning two centuries. But anyway, um, the, apparently the museum staff think it may be a forgery from the 19th century, but there's no concrete evidence. And the author looked more deeply into it, and it seems like it's no younger than the 18th. So may or may not, but it could very well be actually from that time period, you know, somewhere between the 14th and 16th. So this would be the, the closest to the manuscripts. So there are at least these two examples of swords like that, which is, of course, very, very limited evidence, but also the fact that they show up in so many different manuals from different time periods. I mean, it, it's all basically late 15th and early 16th century. Actually, there is an earlier reference. I almost forgot about good old Fiore, who describes a design that can be used as a sword or a pole axe, which is supposed to be sharpened only one hand width from the point. And he mentions that the rondelle or discard should be able to slide up and down the blade. It's also got a heavy pommel with well-tempered spikes. And this is from the 1400s. They're frequent enough to think that it's not just one crazy person sitting down and doodling and coming up with some strange designs. That uh, They probably existed, but it seems to be a, a very specific weapon for judicial duels and tournaments. Uh, if you don't know what a judicial duel is, basically whenever people had a dispute that couldn't be resolved by conventional means, they would just be like, okay, let God decide it. So they would have a duel and, and whoever wins is in the right. That's what they thought. And that could happen in different ways, but when there were noblemen involved, they were usually fighting in full armor. So it would make sense to come up with a dedicated anti-armor sword. Uh, why use a sword rather than a pole arm, which is more effective, arguably, against armor? I would think it has to do with the fact that the sword was considered to be the more noble weapon and more symbolic as well. And also, let's face it, noblemen, sometimes they do things just to look fancy. So basically, this is a situation where you need a pole arm, but you really, really want a sword. And uh, that's what you come up with. So pretty interesting. And you thought fantasy swords are weird, huh? Well, I mean, a lot of them still are, but there was weird stuff in history, too. I hope you found this interesting. Thanks for watching and have a good one, folks.